Hare Krishna. So I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. And I'll speak on the Bhagavad Gita, sixth chapter, uh, text 35, where Krishna speaks about how we should approach ourselves. The topic I'll speak on is learning to be kind to ourselves. So learning to be kind to ourselves. So in the sixth chapter, the whole theme is that to grow spiritually, we need to control our minds. And Krishna gives a systematic process from 6.11 to 6.30, uh, 32, describing the process of mind control from the practice stage to the perfect stage. And then Arjuna expresses his doubts in 6.33 and 34, he says, Krishna, this process seems impossible. Yoyam yogastvaya prokta samye namadusudana etasyaham napashami chanchalatvat stitim stiram. He says, this process seems impossible, staying, keeping the mind equipoised, because he said the mind is restless. And then he goes on and he further describes chanchalam himana krishna pramathi balavadrudham tasyaham nigraham manye vayoriva sudushkaram says the mind is restless it is obstinate it is powerful it is mad and controlling it is more difficult than controlling the mind sorry controlling the wind now here when Krishna has recommended something and Arjuna is saying it's not practical, I can't do it. So at that time, what is Krishna's response? He says, Sri Bhagavan Vacha Asam Shayam Mahabaho Manodurnigraham Chalam Abhyasena Tukanteya Vairagena Chagruhyate So he begins, first of all, by telling Asam Shayam Mahabaho Asamshayam, undoubtedly, O oh Arjuna, it is Manodurnigraham Chalam. The mind is extremely difficult to control. So the first thing that Krishna does with Arjuna is that he accepts Arjuna's point. Yes, it is difficult. Sometimes, you know, when two people, they meet each other and they have some differences of opinion. Then when the meeting is happening, if that meeting is lead to lead to some reconciliation, not further alienation, then even if the two people have 99% disagreement, you need to begin with the 1% agreement. Mm -hmm. that, you know, both of us want the good, want the want to make the best decision in the situation. I appreciate your intention to make the good, the best decision. And I am coming from this perspective, you are coming from that perspective. So this coming, suppose say we go to a doctor and <coughs> even before we speak any symptoms, the doctor gives a prescription. <laughs> hey, what? I didn't even tell my symptoms. I know everything. Now even if the doctor is expert enough to know everything, unless the patient feels understood, the patient will not have the faith to take the prescription the doctor is giving. Similarly, for us, when somebody else is coming and telling something to us, or we, or we are telling, sharing some concerns with others, if before hearing us they start prescribing, do this, do this, we will just not be able to accept that. Now for practical purposes, it is good to treat the mind like another person. In fact, Krishna talks about this in 6.5 in the Bhagavad Gita, when he says, Uddhare datman atmanam natmanam avasadayet atmai vayatmano bandhur atmai varipuratmanaha. He says, elevate yourself. Actually, the word Krishna uses is atma. So, uddhare atman atmanam. So, elevate the self with the self. Natmanam avasadayet. Don't degrade the self. Atmai vaya atmano bandhur. The self is the friend of the self. Atmai va ripur atmanaha. And the self is also the enemy of the self. So it's interesting, Krishna using the word self over here. 
nowadays among books uh, in books there are two broad categories fiction and non fiction so in fiction usually it is romance novels that sell the most in non fiction the genre that sells the most is self help hmm? <laughs> self help now it's interesting self help what does it mean that the self is helping the self it's the idea is that but this understanding of self help means that there is there are actually two selves there is a self that needs help and there is a self that offers the help see it unless there are two how can you how can the self help the self? how is the self going to help the self so this sort of subjective division between object and subject when krishna is saying elevate yourself with yourself what does he mean by this uddhareet atmanatvan that means that we human beings have a capacity to look at ourselves now all living beings are aware of their existence in the sense that all living beings are aware so if there is a say a mosquito over here somewhere um, ant over here the ant will be aware of its surroundings we human beings are also aware, aware of our surroundings so all living beings have awareness but we human beings have the capacity for self awareness self awareness means that i can look at myself so for example while i am sitting here and you are speaking to me so if by a by a act of projection of my thought i can say conceptually put myself in your place and think how do i sound to you i can look at myself and this is actually what we do when we say introspection introspection means look inwards so for example when i am getting angry at someone then one is that i just get angry and act angrily but another is oh you're getting angry now i can catch myself when i am doing something else so basically we have the capacity for self awareness that means i can understand that i am feeling angry right now oh i am i'm just feeling bored when i say i am feeling bored but i can observe myself okay i am feeling bored so basically this capacity of self awareness is foundational for self transformation unless i, I become aware of what i am doing i can't change myself you know some people have uh, they are musically tone deaf they just don't make any they can't make any sense of music at all mm. Mm. they just if the tune is right or wrong they don't understand it now even more problematic are people who are tone deaf and they don't know they are tone deaf <laughs> so a nice kirtan is going on they will come and pick up a kartal and they will start playing the kartal and they are playing it all wrong but they have closed their eyes they are blissful and everybody around them is miserable what are you doing <laughs> so what happens over here is that in that particular area they don't have that self awareness so we do have the capacity for self awareness so for example if somebody is trained at music and trying to play music oh i'm doing something wrong over here let me do it like this now others can help us to become self aware also now but we can be self aware okay i'm acting like this i'm acting like that so our attitude towards ourselves is very important psychologists say that a, a common problem among people who are not very disciplined they say i want to be free i want to do whatever i want to do whenever i want to do i want to be free but people who lack discipline a common problem among them is self loathing self loathing means i dislike myself in fact i detest myself i don't like the way i am so we all have certain expectations from others we all have certain expectations from ourselves and when somehow if we are not able to live according to our expectations we do something which we know we should not be doing and if we keep doing that again and again then we stop liking ourselves 
we start disliking ourselves. Now, should we dislike ourselves? <coughs> Actually, when I say I, we start disliking ourselves, what does it mean? Again, that there's a the sense of two-ness. I am here and I am here, and I don't like myself. I feel that you know I am forgetful, I am irresponsible, I am disorganized, I am lazy, I am this and that, and at one level, this may be required self self criticality where okay this is i'm not doing this right that is required so that i can improve but sometimes this can work negatively if i am constantly beating myself up why did you do like that why did you do like that why did you do like that so then we just become disheartened when we want to practice bhakti we often have certain standards that we want to practice Say I want to do my japa in the morning. I want to do this. I want to follow the standard. I want to follow this, and sometimes our inability to follow those standards may increase our negative attitude towards ourselves, and I may start loathing myself. I'm worthless. I'm useless. I'm fallen. Now again, this could be humility, but. it need not always be humility it could simply be frustrated false ego what is the difference between humility and frustrated false ego in humil humility a uh, the two words you could have humility and humiliation now in humility i don't humility is actually false ego rejected that means i am not dependent on the world's praise whereas humiliation is false ego frustrated i wanted to be respected but this person insulted me i felt so humiliated by that so the attitude is very different sometimes when we feel i am useless i am fallen i am i'm this i'm just like this i'm like that i can't i'm not doing this well i'm not doing that well now if this we may think thinking like this i am being humble but it may not be like that sometimes we tend to become internally is, we speak about ourselves our mind is always speaking it's constantly passing commentary it's constantly whenever whatever is happening the mind is giving a running commentary of that Suppose a cricket match is going on, and normally the cricket match is going on in the stadium, and there is a commentary, there is a commentator's box is there, and from the commentator's box, the commentator is commenting, mm -hmm. and the spectators are watching. They okay, they get a better sense of what is happening with the the commentator's commentary. Now suppose the commentator's commentary is heard not just by the spectators but also by the player, and say <laughs> the player is batting. and the player is trying to the match is in a difficult position but the player is batting well and the commentators are seeking you know this match is in a very difficult position you know it's very difficult to win from this match even if this player is batting well it's a good shot he says yes you batting well but one wrong shot and you are out <laughs> and this player is trying to bat well the and the the player is batting well also but the commentator is saying you know You just a lucky shot. If one thing had gone wrong, you would have got out. So everything, if the commentator keeps giving a negative spin, the player may be batting well, but what will happen? The player will become distracted. He will become discouraged. So similarly, the mind is like a commentator inside us. It's always commenting. Sometimes the mind's commentary makes us believe that we are better than what we are. that things are better one than what they are and sometimes the mind's commentary makes us believe that we are worse than what we are and things are worse than what we are and actually it is the same mind which gives both commentaries suppose say we are just living a normal life and suddenly a friend comes to us and says you know i have got an idea to become rich quickly he says what is that he says let us go and rob a bank <laughs> he says what 
No, 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 I got a foolproof plan, don't worry. I know, nobody will be able to catch us, we'll be able to rob a bank and we'll become rich. He says, no, 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 come with me, don't worry. And say, somehow that friend pushes us, forces us, and we go to the bank. And we rob the bank, and the moment we rob the bank, the, the friend runs away. <laughs> and the police comes and catches us. And then we are taken to the court. And in the court, when we enter, we are put in the criminal's box and we look up and sitting on the judge's seat is that same friend. <laughs> <laughs> that friend who made us do the wrong thing is now judging us. So the mind is like that. <laughs> the mind first makes us do this. Sometimes, you know, hey, come on, eat a little bit more, eat a little bit more, eat a little bit more, a little more, little more. After that, you fool, why do you eat so much? Will you, you will never learn? The mind, when we wake up in the morning, mind says, go to sleep. Little more, you know. Sleep a little more, little more, little more. And then finally, after maybe sleeping too much more, we wake up. You fool, why are you so lazy? When will you learn? So the mind plays this double role. First, it makes us do wrong things. And then it beats us up for doing wrong. And when it beats us up for doing wrong, all that happens by that is we become discouraged. We just become disheartened. So uh, when this self-loathing is happening, when say people feel angry with themselves, feel bad about themselves, dislike themselves, it's basically their mind telling them, you know, you are useless. Nothing is going to work right. You are never going to do anything right. See, normally. Most of us, many of you are parents. And you know that when we are helping the children grow, you have to ensure that we don't speak uh, casual negative statements about children. Because children are, their minds are, for, in, the, in the formative years, you can, you can be shaped very much. So if a child is told repeatedly, say if somebody was going, growing up, say one brother was very good, always at study is coming first, and the other brother is not that good. So if the parents constantly keep comparing this younger brother with the you know, your brother was always get first. You don't come in the top ten also. Again and again they keep comparing. Then even when that younger brother grows up, always that negative conception will be there in the mind. So normally when we are interacting with others, we are careful that we don't casually cast, apply negative labels on others. Because especially if we are responsible for their growth, we know that they should also be encouraged. Certainly, there is some time when chastisement is required and some time when encouragement is required. The idea is that <clears throat> people should always feel hope. Nobody should ever be made to feel hopeless. So if somebody is very discouraged, oh, things like this have gone wrong, that has gone wrong, that has gone wrong. And at that time, so, so actually when we say preaching, preaching means, if you are trying to share Krishna Bhakti, preaching means we should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. Comfort the afflicted means, say, if somebody has lost a loved one. And then if you go and tell them, you know, you lost this loved one, actually all relationships in this world are temporary. Everyone else you love, they are also going to die. You are cable in this world alone, you are going to go alone. That is violence. At that time, the focus should be on speaking. Yes, Krishna is there in your hearts, Krishna is in their hearts also. You pray to Krishna, you know, you, your prayers through Krishna will reach them. Wherever they go, you can still pray for their good and bring good in their lives. So, when somebody is distressed, our world should not distress them further. If somebody is very confident, I'm happy, I don't need anything in life, I, I'm happy, I'm successful, I'm powerful, then Prabhupada would say, for how long? Actually, Prabhupada met uh, Ambarish Prabhu, Alfred Ford. Uh, so, he was introduced, the devotee was introduced, he's the great grandson of Henry Ford. So, Prabhupada looked at him gravely and he said, oh, so you're the great grandson of Henry Ford? Where is he now? So Ambarish Prabhu, Alfred Ford became later became Ambarish Prabhu. So he says that 
at that time i understood prabhupad is a saint he said he is not impressed by my wealth you went prabhupad say, saying where is he now that means he built this whole ford empire but he just left it here and is gone somewhere we don't even know where he is gone his wealth has not gone with him so prabhupad is somebody uh, prabhupad is is not impressed by material wealth necessarily if material wealth could be used in krishna service he would use it but if somebody is very proud then you have to point out everything is temporary over here so we have to give the right medicine at the right time if somebody is discouraged and we chastise them further they will become even more discouraged somebody is already very proud and we flatter them we praise them they will become even bigger so what a person needs that's what we need to give and the same applies to us also in our attitude towards ourselves the mind does exactly the opposite of what we should be doing you know when we have some foolish idea you know maybe you can invest money in this and you know, maybe you can go and gamble over here we will put a little more money in gambling put a little more money in gambling mm. the mind is saying you know you can earn more you can make a lot of interest you can get a lot of money mind keeps pushing do that do that do that so when there is something fool foolhardy something dangerous the mind encourages that time we need cautioning come on do it do it do it and then everything collapses we lose all the money and then we are already depressed in the mind says fool why did you put the money don't you have any common sense <laughs> so what happens is the same mind is turning around and beating us up beating us up so when this is happening when we start beating ourselves up we may think you know by this by being harsh with myself being strict with myself i will i will become better and i will not commit this mistake in future but it may not happen like that why not because ultimately to do the right thing we don't just need the right knowledge we also need the right inspiration in wisconsin university there were a group of students who wanted to become writers and this was an experiment done by sociologists and they had so they had a group of boys and a group of girls so this group of boys they thought that in order to help us become better writers we will all write and we will submit our writings to each other and we will all point out the faults in what we have written in what others have written and in that way we can improve our writing so the girls they thought okay boys have done that we'll do the exact opposite <laughs> so this is whatever you if we write whatever any of us writes we will find the good in that and appreciate that and then they followed this this group of aspiring writers 10 years down the line and they found that among the boys not one of them had become a published writer Uh, and most of them if they you ask their friends they said you know, they don't write very clearly and if you ask them themselves they would say that as soon as i have to write something i start perspiring i feel worried when i am writing i i feel inhibited when i am writing on the other hand among the girls they found that several of them had become published writers and all of them were considered very articulate by their colleagues by their colleagues they were considered very articulate so basically when encouragement was there that fanned the good and the person became better but when constant criticism was there then it did not fan the good even whatever good it did it whatever good was there one felt that it's so much bad what is the use of the good is too much bad over it. just better give it up so basically our attitude towards ourselves should also be such that we feel positive we feel encouraged even when we commit mistakes and we all will commit mistakes even when we commit mistakes you know that we are not okay one particular mistake is there sometimes it may be a serious mistake also but still we are never lost there is always tomorrow when we can improve 
we can always change and come back on the right track we are our only resource if i want to become a better person i am i am i am my only resource for self improvement everyone else is a aid even my spiritual master the holy name the association of devotees or whatever techniques we may learn for self improvement all of these are aids but i am my only resource so if i if i become discouraged if i start thinking i am useless i am hopeless then we are making the only resource that we have uh, unavailable for ourselves at one time we had a group of devotee writers we wanted to work on an important project so we had gone to a retreat on a hill station sort of place but when we went there we found that none of our phones was working there was no range over there so then when we we got one internet dongle and we took that with us and you know, every, four of us were there every time we would go from one place to another even from one room to another room one cabin to another cabin all right have you taken the dongle have you taken the dongle have you taken the dongle because that was our only connection with the rest of the world so we had to do some research you had to find out a say synonym for a word meaning of a word get some reference that's what we needed so if that is the only resource we have we'll keep it so carefully hmm? if we are in a place where say there are no phones available and we are gone with the phone if we lose that phone we won't get any phone only we'll keep that phone very carefully so if something is the only resource we have we'll keep it very carefully so similarly if we understand that i am my only resource then we will be careful in our attitude towards ourselves now careful doesn't mean to pamper ourselves careful doesn't mean that oh everything that i'm doing is right but i have to have a healthy attitude towards myself when we understand that we are our only resource and by we i can refer to the help i've talked about two selves you know that the self that needs help and the self that offers help so what does it mean this uh, if we consider the bhagavad gita's philosophy what does the self that needs help and the self that offers help what does it mean actually we could say that inside us the soul is at the innermost level i am the soul but inside me the mind is also there so when krishna says elevate yourself with the self so prabhupada translates one atma there is the mind that means he is saying elevate yourself with the mind and don't degrade yourself so the mind is what we use for directing our thoughts the mind is our tool for thinking just as the throat is our is our tool for speaking or the ear is a tool for hearing so that means if i am going to speak something so then if i have if i am going to speak i should speak in a way that is constructive not that which is destructive so similarly krishna is saying use your mind to elevate yourself not degrade yourself so just as we are our only resource similarly our mind is the only mind we have <laughs> even if our mind is conditioned even if our mind is troublesome even if our mind is uh, treacherous still this is the mind we have and this is the mind with which we have to work so of course because the mind can mislead us we have to be cautious but at the same time we cannot afford to hate the mind and we cannot afford to hate ourselves because of whatever we may have done in the past we are our only resource and therefore we have to handle this resource with care as i said we need hope always if we lose hope then we lose everything the bhagavad gita demonstrates this right at its beginning that arjuna as a formidable warrior he was a warrior who could defeat all other warriors and that's what he did in the kurukshetra war eventually but even before the kurukshetra war started 
this form foremost of all warriors was defeated without a single arrow being shot defeated in the sense that he put down his bow and he said visruchi sasharam japam shokasam vigna manasah in 1.46 last was the first chapter is krishna he put aside his bow in grief nayot saiti govindam uktva tushnim bhavah in 2.9 says i can't fight krishna he gave up so this is the power we could say of negative emotions of negative thoughts when he lost hope how can i fight in this war he just he lost the war without a single arrow being fought similarly in the battle of life we all have various battles oh, which we have to fight during our life we don't have to fight physical battles but we do have to fight uh, in life but if we lose hope then we lose everything so maintaining hope is very important and a consistent negative attitude towards ourselves loathing ourselves or hating ourselves that soon saps away our hope so how do we get this positive attitude towards ourselves and how do we maintain that positive attitude in a healthy way that we don't become unrealistically positive so <clears throat> you know that there is there are vaccines that are given to especially small children or even to people in general if they are in a disease prone area now vaccines basically involve uh, a small sample of that same disease germs are put into the body and if they are put in a small regulated quantity then the body notes of this aggressors are coming and the body equips itself and when the body's defenders the wbcs are activated then eventually even if more of those germs come into the body the body is equipped to defend it so now if somebody's immune system is good and then they are given vaccines the vaccines will ensure that they become stronger entry of the vaccine will ensure that the active immune system will begin functioning and will uh, make it make them better equipped but if their immune system is already very poor and then they are given vaccines what will happen that very vaccine will cause the disease so we could say self criticism is like vaccination if my morale is very low it's like my immunity system immune system is very low and at that time the vaccine is given what will happen at that time when the vaccine is given that means i criticize myself others criticize me i just become totally demoralized on the other hand if i am happy i am confident and then i realize you know okay you i am doing reasonably well but this is something where i am doing going wrong and if i don't check myself things will become much worse oh, then i'll become more careful let me do this right so we need a healthy sense of self respect or self esteem if we don't have that then even a small criticism can become big and what happens is when we start loathing ourselves and start disliking ourselves we feel you know i i want to do i wanted to do that but i couldn't do it i you know, i wanted to do that but i couldn't do it we become angry with ourselves and quite often this anger at ourselves gets expressed as irritability towards others uh, krishna sindh bhagavad gita last anger greed these are three inner enemies trividham narkasyedam dwaram nashanam atmanah kamah krodha satha lobha tasmad etat trayam tejet in 16.21 he says that now among these if we consider last anger and greed if i am greedy say i see some object i want to buy this now i want to buy it i start craving 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 for it so generally in in greed the trigger of the desire and the target of the desire are the same i see an object i desire i want it but with respect to anger the trigger and the target are two different things 
Sometimes we may go to office and we may ask our boss something and the boss will expl explodes. Hey, what happened? You know, I, I just spoke something small. Why did the boss explode? So probably they at home the boss had a quarrel with their spouse and they come home office and they blast at their colleagues, blast at their subordinates. So what happens? The trigger of anger and the target of anger are two different things. So similarly, in our spiritual life, now if we want to follow high standards and somehow we are not able to follow those standards or in general we have high expectations from ourselves and if we are not able to uh, stick to those expectations, then we start becoming irritated with ourselves. And sometimes that irritation with ourselves comes out as irritation with others. So when we are anyway annoyed, then some small spark cause, causes an explosion. It's like say, if, uh, if there is oil spilled somewhere and you light a matchstick, immediately a big fire will come. If there is no oil over there, even if you light a matchstick, nothing will happen. So sometimes our inner struggles and our inner failures, they are like spilling oil on the floor. And then somebody comes and does some small thing which is wrong. That's like the matchstick. Boom! Big fire starts off at that time. So generally, when we start, start we start practicing spiritual life, actually our spiritual life would make us more peaceful, more mature, more understanding towards others. But sometimes we may find that because of our spiritual practices, or not because, but after starting our spiritual practices, we may end up becoming more irritable. Now that happens because we have started becoming too harsh with ourselves. So be gentle. Be gentle means that we have to understand where we are and from there we take a step forward. I will conclude with two points and then if you have any questions we can discuss. The first point is that <coughs> A, that we have to begin from where we are, not where we think we should be. Say, if we are going for an important meeting or a program, and we are driving a car, and somehow we will take one wrong turn. And then we take a wrong turn, and that sometimes on these big expressways, if we take one wrong turn, it takes a long time to come back on the right track also. So one wrong turn means it will become 10 minutes delay. Mm -hmm. After another wrong turn, it may be 20 minutes delay. So now suppose I have gone off track and I'm going to be 20 minutes late. And at that time in the car, I start beating myself. You fool, why did you take that wrong turn? Why did you take that wrong turn? Why did you take that wrong turn? Okay, Baba, you took the wrong turn. Now take the right turn and go back. <laughs> now why did you take the wrong turn? Why? Why? So at that time. If I am thinking, oh, I should have been there now, I would be five minutes, I would be there for the meeting. But now I am 25 minutes late. Okay, but if I have to get there, we have to begin from where we are, not where we think we should be. So, sometimes we have an idea that, you know, this is how I should be. For example, if I resolve to do something, then I must do it. If I resolve to say, Wake up, wake up in the morning, I resolve to keep do this on time, I do resolve to do this. And if I don't do it, then I just become so angry with myself that instead of doing it now, I am wasting my energy. Why did I do it then? Why, did I, why didn't I do it then? Why didn't I do it then? Okay, I couldn't do it, do it now. So with respect to physical examples, it's easy to understand. If, you know, we would not, if we, were, if we had gone off track, we would not just sit stationary in our car. You know, why did I take that wrong turn? Why did I take that wrong turn? We would not be so foolish. We would immediately start coming back. But with respect to our inner world, because things are not, not so physically visible, so we don't understand what we are doing. But sometimes we just, even if we have taken a wrong turn, it doesn't matter. Take a right turn now and come back on track. But internally, we just keep beating ourselves. Fool. Why did you do that? 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 Okay, I did that. So I made a mistake on my part. Let me do the right thing. So, 
if, if we have a unrealistic conception of where we should be and this is how I should be and we live in denial of how we are I'm not ready to accept that I am here I think I should be here but if, if I think I should be here while I am here then all that is going to happen is that the energy which I could use to rise from here to here I am just using it to beat myself while I am here so I stay here itself so we need to accept this is where I am and from here I can go there so that's why it's important for us in our spiritual life or in our life in general not to we all want to improve we all want to become better human beings better devotees better in whatever we are doing in our life but the journey to improvement has to begin from where we are not where we think we should be if I accept I'm here okay what are the steps that I can take from moving from here to here and humility is not seen in beating ourselves up for being where we are now for, for making the mistake and being there but humility is seen there in acceptance sometimes I may think that when I'm beating myself up I'm becoming humble no by beating myself up mentally I'm not becoming humble I am simply acting out of my frustrated false ego my false ego wants that I should be here but I am here and I am beating myself so it's simply the frustrated false ego acting but humility means okay I am here and from here I have to take steps forward so accepting that we may not be as good as we imagine we should be this acceptance is humility but denying that is actually an act of ego so having said that okay if, if I wanted to be here and if I end up here now I will feel discouraged oh no I'm so I got such a long distance to go I've not even covered this much distance what is the use but we should know that no matter even if we have committed mistakes no matter how many things we have done wrong Krishna is always with us Krishna never abandons us so Krishna always loves us we all have weaknesses such as then we lust anger greed uh, self-criticality whatever else but these are not our biggest weakness our greatest weakness is our unwillingness to believe that Krishna loves us even now as we are right now Krishna loves us our greatest weakness is our unwillingness to believe that Krishna loves us the Krishna is there in our hearts no matter what we do there we don't have the power to do anything that will make Krishna say I'm going to quit your heart and go away now Krishna will always be there with us he never loses hope on us he is always there with us wanting us to become better so by fixing our eyes on Krishna on his untiring uh, unfailing love for us which we learn from scripture by associating with devotees who have faith in scripture then we can that can become the enduring source of our hope and does Krishna love us even when we commit mistakes yes he still loves us so I I was in rally in North Carolina I gave a series of two classes on are our mistakes part of Krishna's plan now if I commit a mistake then is it Krishna's plan that I commit the mistake what do you think yes and no Yes, it is a safe answer <laughs> yeah actually we need to differentiate between Krishna's plan and Krishna's purpose so our mis that we commit mistakes is not Krishna's purpose Krishna doesn't want us to commit mistakes but Krishna's plan is so inclusive that even if we commit mistakes that is included in this plan say a simple example for this if there is a school 
the school's purpose is to educate the students so that they rise to a higher standard. But if a student fails, the school has a plan for them also. So the failed students are also a part of the school's plan. Okay, you fail in this exam, now you do this, you do the subject again, you do the, you do this course, you go do this tuition, you get this help. So the failed students are also a part of the school's plan. But the failed failing the students is not the school's purpose. So similarly, whatever mistakes we make, they are part of Krishna's plan. That doesn't mean that Krishna plans those mistakes for us, but rather even if we commit mistakes, we don't go out of Krishna's plan. No matter how many mistakes we commit, still Krishna has a plan. Sometimes the school might be there that if you fail once, twice, thrice, four times, he said they will say that, you know, now you can just leave the school. But Krishna is not like that. No matter how many times we commit a mistake, Krishna, we are still within Krishna's plan. And from wherever we are, Krishna can help us to rise upwards. The other example for this, understanding Krishna's plan and Krishna's purpose is, say again, Google Maps. If Google is telling me turn left to go to, and I turn right. Now if I turn right, what will happen? Google will quickly recalibrate and give me a path from there. Again, if I take a wrong turn, again Google will recalibrate and tell me go, go this way. Even if I take a thousand wrong turns, still Google will show me a path back. Now, of course, each wrong turn will have a consequence and from that uh, wrong turn to come back to the right destination will take more time. But still, the path is there. So similarly, you could say Krishna is like the ultimate Google guide. <laughs> no matter how many mistakes we make, Krishna will immediately, Krishna's plan is so inclusive that wherever, what, no matter how many wrong turns we take, Krishna will give us a path to him. So in that sense, Krishna's love and Krishna's willingness to help us is always there. So even if we commit mistakes, at a material level, the mistakes will have consequences. And it will take wrong, longer to come back to the right track. But we always have the chance to come back. And that's why we needn't ever lose hope. Sometimes the looking at the world may cause us to lose hope. But we look beyond the world to Krishna. And then we gain back our confidence, we gain back our morale. That's what happened to Arjuna. When he heard the Bhagavad Gita, at the start of the Bhagavad Gita, he put aside his bow, saying, I can't fight. But at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, he had picked up his bow in readiness to fight. Similarly, the world's events, the things that are happening in our mind, they may all cause us to lose hope. But if we turn towards the Gita and understand the Gita's message, of Krishna's unfailing love for us, then we will get the hope, we will get the faith back and we can move forwards. In the Vishnu Sahasranam, there are two names which seem to be the exact opposite. So, Animisho Nimisha Swagri Vachas Patirudharadhi. So, Animisha and Nimisha. Animisha means one who never blinks his eyes and Nimisha means one who blinks his eyes. So, Srila Baldevidya Bhushan has explained the various names, the meanings of various names. And he says, Animisha and Nimisha. What does it mean? He says, if a devotee is trying to render service to Krishna, the, the Lord unblinkingly notes even the smallest service that the devotee is doing. And if a devotee somehow commits a mistake, and Krishna blinks his eyes and overlooks the mistake. <laughs> And that's how Krishna is always benevolent, always eager for the devotee to come to him. And the example for this is, when Putana came to kill Krishna, what did Krishna do? Closed his eyes. Krishna overlooked her malevolent intention. And he saw only her maternal affection. At a material level, because she had a malevolent intention, there was a consequence. She lost her material body. But at a spiritual level, Krishna saw her little maternal affection that she had and he magnified that. And he took her to the spiritual. Aho bakiyam yamstan, aho bakiyam yamstan kalakutam. That demon who had come with the intention to kill Krishna, Krishna elevated her to the level of the nurse uh, in the spiritual world. Oh, that's how, even if we have committed a million mistakes, Krishna 
is ready to overlook those mistakes. Krishna wants us to come to him. And from wherever we are, if we learn to be kind to ourselves, kind to ourselves means that we act in a way that keeps us encouraged, keeps us hopeful. We, our attitude towards ourselves should be that, you know, I am my only resource, so let me be kind to myself. Kind doesn't mean to flatter all the time and to imagine nothing is wrong. But no matter what is wrong, let me take the right step and move on. Even if I again go wrong, let me again take the right step and move on. So when we have this learn to be kind to ourselves, then we'll find that much of the negativity within us will go down. And whatever positive opportunities come, we'll be able to use them much better in moving forwards in our life to do the contributions that we can during this life and to ultimately attain the supreme destination of Krishna's eternal abode. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on the topic of learning to be kind to ourselves. And in that I spoke about, first <coughs> I started by talking about how we, uh, we may have different attitudes towards ourselves. I talked about how if some doctor gives a prescription without understanding, uh, we will not be convinced about taking the prescription. So Krishna, when Arjuna says, I can't control the mind, Krishna shows understanding. Yes, it is difficult to control the mind. And that understanding is what lowers Arjuna's guards. So even if there is 99% disagreement, begin with the 1% agreement. So similarly for us, sometimes when we are looking at ourselves, we human beings have self-awareness. That means we can look at ourselves and understand where we are. Self-awareness is the basis of self-improvement. In self-help, there is a self that needs help and the self that offers the help. So this sort of inner division within ourselves is possible because we have self-awareness. So we often have, a, a, we may have negativity towards ourselves, self-loathing, because we want to do certain things and we are not able to do it and we keep beating ourselves within. So our mind is what acts the, as the primary agent of self-loathing. So it is like a person, a friend who tells us to rob a bank, and then ditches us when we the crimes hits us and then actually become the judge to beat us up. So to punish similarly, the mind tells us to do wrong and then beats us up for doing that wrong. So when the mind starts taking this double role, we need to understand that this mind is fooling me. So uh, preaching means that when somebody is discouraged, we need to encourage them to comfort the afflicted. And if somebody is too overconfident flying in the air, bring them down to the ground. To afflict the comforted and that applies to ourselves also when we are discouraged we need encouragement when we are overconfident we need a dose of reality so this so the same situation can act differently now vaccine if somebody is healthy a good immune system vaccine will make them stronger so if it's poor immune system the vaccine may cause a disease similarly self-criticism can help us if we have healthy self-esteem if we don't have healthy self-esteem, self-criticism can dishearten us even more. So, if we lose hope, we lose everything. Just like Arjuna lost hope and put aside his bow, the warrior who could not be defeated in the actual fight, physical fight, was defeated in the internal mental fight without a single arrow being caused. Like that, we may lose by the constant negativity being bombarded within us by the mind. So, to avoid this, what do we do? First thing is, that we understand that we are our only resource. It's like if we have only one internet connection, we'll keep it carefully. If we have only one phone, we'll keep it carefully. So I am my only resource. If ever there's to be improvement, it is I who have to do the improvement. And then if we want to actually go about the improvement, we have to begin where we are, not where we think we should be. If I have gone off track, then beating myself up why I'm not on the right track doesn't help. Just go move back and come on the right track. So humility is not beating ourselves is not humility. That's simply frustrated, false ego acting out. But humility means accepting that I made a mistake, that I'm this at this place, and then working gracefully to move towards a better situation. 
and we can get our greatest hope by contemplating on Krishna's unfailing love for us. There is nothing we can do that can make Krishna leave our heart and go away. It can make him stop loving us. So that we commit mistakes is not Krishna's purpose, but it is included in Krishna's plan. Just like a student failing is not a school's purpose, but the school's plan includes that. Uh, just as taking a wrong turn is not, our taking a wrong turn is not Google Maps purpose. But if you do that, then still give us a right track, right path back. Similarly, no matter how many mistakes we have made in the past, no matter how many mistakes we may make in the future, still, as soon as we realize we are taking a wrong turn, if we take a right turn and come back, we will steadily move towards Krishna. And Krishna is so compassionate that when we commit mistakes, he overlooks those mistakes by blinking his eyes. We are doing something good, he unblinkingly notes it and he rewards us. So such is our loving Lord and by trying to stay connected with him, we can all move towards having positive energy within us which will help us move steadily towards our Lord. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, Ram. Um, Prabhu, I think, uh, thank you so much. This uh, mind, um, I, I'm just thinking, you know, all this, uh, many and many lifetimes we are carrying this uh, issues, but hmm. we, we may not realize or we don't uh, even think that, you know, this has happened because I cannot remember anything. But in the childhood, if somebody discourages, and that actually, I'm thinking that, you know, we carry that discouragement even today after 30 years um, or 40 years. And that keeps on telling, oh, even though if I want to encourage, there is somebody saying, hey, you cannot do that. That means I heard from my elders, they discouraged me, I don't, I don't know how to get up or get out of that. You know, so that's so much condition. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm thinking I'm fortunate I'm here at least I understand uh, you know this is what I need to do but still that's not that easy to get out of that discouragement what I had that uh, in the foundation of my life mm -hmm. that, that means in my childhood of my life uh, during the childhood so how do I come out of that yeah actually let me answer so if we have had some child expressions which we have which keep troubling us right now so how do we go over this actually i had a whole class on this topic it is called how to go past our past <laughs> <laughs> and i had used an acronym past but i have forgotten that acronym so i was trying to search for that powerpoint so that i could tell that acronym but i would say some broad principles Mm. There is the mind is something which has its own momentum that we can't control what comes in the mind. If something is impressed in it, it is already impressed there. And something is going to come up in it, it is going to come up. Say so if you have a if a computer which is a company computer. Uh, then the company computer, some, some programs may just open up in it. Now you may never want to use that program, but that program will just open up. You try to focus on closing that program, go here, go there, you don't find any way to close the program. But if you want to do some work, you can open some other program and continue your work. So that program will be open in the background, it will consume some, some power, some memory, but you can do your work. So similarly for us, the impressions that were formed in the past, uh, we can't get rid of them. And they will, they will open up in our consciousness. But if we have something purposeful to do, something positive to do, then we won't get so affected by it. That means, we could say that our mind is like a computer screen on which many programs are open. So some programs just open up. So some programs open up means, say, 
now I have given, I don't know, for several thousand classes I have given, I have spoken in public. But even now, every time when I start speaking, a program opens up. You are going to make a fool of yourself. You are going to forget a verse, you are going to forget important points. And actually every time the class gets over, you didn't tell that example. You didn't speak that. You didn't do that. It comes up. So now, at one level, if I try to stop that, I can't. But I can choose whether to pay attention to it or not. See, so the mind and what happens within it, the mind is like a child. Sometimes some children start making some funny faces. They start all making funny faces. And if you look at them, they get more animated. They start making more funny faces. <laughs> but if we don't pay the attention to them, we'll try to make some more funny faces. But nobody is saying that what is the use of doing the performance. And they'll become silent. <laughs> so the mind is like that. So sometimes, uh, this is what happens that uh, the, uh, my, uh, based on the past impressions, certain things will come up within us. But when they come up, what do we do? Do we focus on them or do we focus on something constructive? So if we think that that program should not open up only, that you know, this person said this, oh, that starts playing, you know, this person said you will never be successful in your life. That's what you're going to say. Uh, you are a good for nothing person. <coughs> that, that script will come up, but if I don't pay attention to it, it, it can't do much harm. We have to understand that our thoughts are themselves not real. Hmm? Our thoughts are not real. So, do any of, I suppose all of you have your phones. Mm. Can you take out your phone? Mm. Hmm? Don't read the messages there, just take it out. <laughs> <laughs> so now, say to yourself, I can't lift my phone. Just say to yourself, I can't lift my phone. <laughs> no, just say, you, I can't lift my phone. <laughs> and lift it now. Lift it. So, say you, I, while saying, I can't lift my phone, and lift, you say, lift it. Now do the two together. I can't lift my phone. Now, if, when you are saying this, you are also thinking it. I may think I can't lift my phone, but actually you can lift it. So, I am giving this as a simple example to illustrate that our thoughts are not real. They can be real at times, but the thoughts are not intrinsically real. We assume, our, we take our thoughts sometimes very seriously. We think our thoughts are real, our thoughts are important, our thoughts have to be obeyed, our thoughts are truthful, but they are not. So, uh, if we just learn to recognize that this is a program that has opened up within me, but I have the choice whether to pay attention to it or not. And slowly, uh, it's not, uh, we can shift our focus elsewhere. And as we do that more and more, then what will happen is that negative focus, negative program that is opened up, that will stop being so prominent. So at one level, it's a matter of intention. Now what do I focus on? Do I fo is my intention over here or second is over here? And then second is also intelligence. Intelligence means when something, some impression that has been formed in our mind, is it true or is it not true? We have to use our, not at that time when it's popped up. That time we just redirect our focus. But later on when we are calmer, when we are not so uh, vulnerable, that time we sit and use our intelligence. Now this, this person said this about me 25 years ago. Is it true? Look at our own life. Okay, you know, if I had been good for nothing, I have been able to do this, do this, do this. It's not that we want to be proud of ourselves, but we have to be realistic in accepting praise and realistic in expect, accepting criticism also. So then using our intelligence, we can come up with points. One, two, three, and this is why this is not true. This one, two, three, four, five, six. And then write it down and keep it accessible. So whenever that program pops up, you, know, you are good for nothing, then read this. Basically, we, when the mind starts going in unwanted directions, we need our intelligence. But the mind is so powerful that the mind just pushes, pushes the intelligence behind. 
and it just becomes inaccessible. So if we make sure that the, the product of the intelligence that points written down are readily accessible to us, that will help us at that particular time. So <coughs> there is intention, there is intelligence and ultimately there is purification. Purification means when we keep practicing bhakti, when we connect with Krishna, the connection with Krishna simply actually causes these negative programs within the mind to get eliminated, to go so much into the background that they are no longer there. In the, first, in the By intention, we redirect our focus. By intelligence, we evaluate whether what is being said is true or not. Both of these are meant to manage while that unwanted program is present. But purification means the program itself will go away. That may take time. And it will take time, how much time it will take will depend on how much we entertain that program. Say some of us before practicing bhakti might have been eating meat. And after practicing bhakti we may decide I will give up meat eating. meat eating. Now if you are going in a flight and then the neighbor is taking meat. Now how many of us will feel tempted you know I want to eat meat. Even if we see there is no temptation. Now they might be eating something else. Hey, I also want to eat it. The temptation may come. With respect to meat, that program has just gone out of it, gone away. So for the bhakti can eliminate the unwanted programmings also, but that may take time. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have to be patient. It has already eliminated some programs from within us. Some have not been eliminated, but with intelligence, intention, and the practice of bhakti, which leads to purification, that's how we can go past our past. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Yes. to the first question. Okay. <laughs> so, the, uh, Prabhu, I lost the context when you were saying about that we on, not only need knowledge sometimes, we also need inspiration. Hmm. That's the point you mentioned. So, uh, I was not clear on what kind of inspiration you were talking about. Is it an embodiment of the knowledge or is it, because some people derive inspiration also from the knowledge itself. Uh, okay. Hmm. And second question is like... No, then, one question, oh. I'll complete this and I'll answer that. I'll take so when I said that we need knowledge and inspiration, but it is sometimes that the knowledge itself gives inspiration. Uh, I would say that knowledge and inspiration are two distinct things in the sense that if I want to travel from place A to place B, uh, I, need, I need to have a map of how to get there. But then if there is heavy traffic, the road is difficult, then I should have some inspiration, some motivation, why do I want to go there? So knowledge is how to go there, inspiration is why to go there. Okay. So I, I was speaking that in the context of say, these um, students from the school who had participating in writing, say they just lost inspiration to write. They said I will never be able to do right, right. So the boys who were always criticizing each other, they felt I can't, we can't do it. And then they just stopped doing it. So for us, inspiration gives us the why. And uh, knowledge gives us, you could say, the how. Okay. Yeah. We need Other to overcome obstacles. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Thank you. Yeah, second question. So it was about this writing thing. So mm. it was very amazing the example that you gave that how. So these people, the scientific study that you mentioned, and these the boys they analyze somebody else's written article and they criticize it. Yeah. Yeah, I found it very interesting because it's the part of writing, right? The critique is very important. So I just couldn't understand that why they lost the view just because they were so critical about somebody else's. Okay, I understood your question. You know, if uh, normally whenever we write, there is peer review, and in yeah. peer review, there is yeah. criticism. Yeah. So then, why would they lose zeal for writing just because they were criticized? Mm. So there are, I would say, there are two different kinds of writings. One is writing which we do because uh, we are we are inspired, say somebody wants to become a, as a vocation a writer. Mm -hmm. And for somebody, writing is just a professional obligation. We are expected to write. Mm -hmm. Generally, even if we, say if our boss criticizes us, we may become discouraged but still we will do our work. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that's a matter of bread and butter. Paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> we need the paycheck. So, at that point, in general, even if there is criticism and there is discouragement, there is the feeling that this is essential, I have to do it. 
but generally with respect to voluntary activities if for somebody somebody they choose uh, somebody can choose some other career and writing is a career which they want to choose or it could they just mean choose that and writing if as a hobby if i feel i can't do this well then we should not do this so generally if something is mandatory for us to do we will do it even if we are criticized and discouraged mm. but if something is voluntary then if we are criticized and discouraged we may just stop doing it and for us in a sadhaka stage bhakti doesn't appear to be mandatory yeah. it appears to be voluntary yeah. you know so if somebody discourages us too much criticizes us too much say why should i do this so that's why we have to make sure that we in our interaction with other don't become too critical because otherwise people will just give up bhakti why should, why, why do you need to do this okay thank okay. you any other questions yes my dear how do we feel krishna's love on a day to day basis there are broadly three ways we could say there is uh, there is intelligence there is experience and there is realization mm, what does that mean that even with our intelligence right now our if we analyze our existence our existence is dependent on something beyond ourselves we may say that i work and i earn my living and i get my food but actually even with our fullest measure of hard work we cannot produce grains they are produced in nature so it is said that every morning when birds grow or birds wake up and they start chirping and searching for grains the birds have to fly here and then search for grains but the birds searching for grains doesn't produce the grains grains are already provided by nature by god ultimately so the birds efforts are secondary god's provision is primary similarly for whatever we are for whatever we are doing right now for whatever we are able to do for all that our efforts are important but there is a higher providence that also is important so whatever skills we are able to achieve if we are able to do a job if we are able to do well in our exams we are using our intelligence but you know we didn't uh, we we were not like when we go to buy a computer we want the specifications and again the specifications i buy the computer now in in our mother's womb we did not pay for the specifications that we wanted <laughs> is it we got them sometimes we may feel that oh i i don't have this ability that ability but we have some ability and we didn't produce those abilities so our very existence right now depends on things beyond our control so the <clears throat> the science magazine at one time they they evaluated that if we had to like we pay for electricity power uh, electricity and other things to the government if humanity had to pay to nature for all the resources they took we know we took timber we take fuel we take this we take that it would be it would be like one day's expenditure would be more than a year's budget that's what you would have to pay so there is something beyond us on which we are dependent and yes sometimes things don't work out the way we want so the see the problem is that that higher factor which is there we don't think about it normally Like every day when we eat food, uh, the food gets digested. The only time when we think of our digestion is when it doesn't work. <laughs> so we assume it. So basically, for our day-to-day -day functioning, right now, if we see, with the Bhagavad Gita uses the word "jnana chakshu," "pashanti jnana chakshu shaha," the eyes of knowledge. If we see, then right now also we can see that even at a material level for our existence. we depend on something bigger than us and that through scriptures we understand is god is krishna and secondly with respect to that's intelligence second is experience experience means that if we look back at our life there are often times 
when things have gone wrong. But there are also times when things have gone right. And sometimes if you look back at our life, you understand you know, this terrible thing that happened at that time, because of this, this good came out. So there's a fundamental difference between the way we look at life and the way Krishna looks at life. Now we look at the present and plan the future. Krishna looks at the future and plans the present. <laughs> so what that means is that say a child has got some stomach pain. A child goes to a doctor. A child thinks the doctor will give me some pill and I'll become healthy. But the doctor sees this infection this infection is very serious. And in the future there will be big complications. Therefore, the doctor may decide, you know, we have to give an injection, we have to do a surgery also. From the child's perspective, I had a little stomach pain, now surgery is a bigger pain. But that is what is needed to save one from a far bigger pain in future. So similarly, now if you take this time scale backwards, then when something happened in the past, at that time we may have felt it was bad. But now if we look back, okay, that was that happened for my good. So everything that happens is not necessarily good. But everything that happens can be for good. The different, it itself is not good. The surgery is not necessarily good. It's not that I will enjoy the surgery ever. The surgery will be painful. But I can it can be for my good. So if you look back at the past and see how good has come out from even the bad, that will give us the, uh, the experience. Oh, this is what has happened. And beyond that realization, what it means is that if we start practicing bhakti, then by the practice of bhakti, we start experiencing some non-material joy, some non-material strength. What bhakti does is that even when problems come in our life, if we remember Krishna amid those problems, we get relief. So, it's like say, outside it's very cold. And if I come inside a room, it's heat conditioning there. I get relief. So the material world is like outside. There's so many problems, they agitate us. We just bring the mind to Krishna. Focus the mind on Krishna. We get relief. What is this relief? Why do we experience it? So at this stage, because our spiritual eyes are not open, we can't understand this is Krishna giving us this relief. But we can realize that at a material level there is a problem, but somehow I am experiencing some relief. I am experiencing some shelter. I am experiencing some calmness. So where is this coming from? If we practice bhakti, then we can see that maybe 10 years before, if this problem had come in my life, I might have just crumbled under the problem. But now, I am able to survive it. I am able to go through it. So we, when we experience this non-material uh, security or non-material strength, even amidst material difficulties, then that gives us the conviction that there is a higher level of reality. That higher level of reality is for real and the relief that I can experience over there is also real. So this is a realization. That which is a what does the realization mean? Realization means that which is a reality, I accept it to be a reality or I understand it to be a reality. So that there is a spiritual side to life that is for real. That Krishna is our is the supreme spiritual reality and he wants us to come to the supreme spirit, that spiritual level is for real. But we don't have the spiritual vision to perceive it right now. Although we can't perceive it, we can experience it. Bhakti Pareshanu Bhava Virakti Ranyatracha. Bhakti is the process which gives us Paraisha Anubhav, the experience of the transcendental Lord. And what is the result of that experience? Virakti Ranyatracha. We become detached. The worldly things don't affect us so much. So, one concluding example to illustrate this point. Say, when, a, when a child is newborn, now the child doesn't even understand that there is someone called my mother. The child just, you know, oh, there's some nice, nice liquid coming from somebody. The child just suckles it and drinks. But as the child starts growing, this is my mother, she loves me. Say at night, the child is sleeping. 
child starts trembling because suddenly the temperature goes down it's feeling cold mother sees my baby is trembling and the mother puts a blanket a nice comforter and the child starts feeling comforted now the child has not opened the eyes but at one moment the child was feeling cold next moment the child feels cozy and warm now if the child has grown up a little bit then the child must have this my mother must have put this blanket although child, my eyes have not been opened although not it's not seen anything but just from the experience the child infers my mother must be here my mother must have put the blanket around me similarly for us when we experience distress in life when we experience trouble in life we start trembling but if we at that time strive to remember krishna chant his holy names hear his kirtans pray to the deities immerse ourselves in krishna katha then that acts like a comforter we experience the relief so although we may not see krishna right now but just the relief that we experience in the remembrance of krishna in absorption krishna is we should see with the eyes of knowledge is the evidence that krishna loves me and krishna is like a loving mother who has put the comforter around me so through intelligence through experience and through realization we can perceive krishna's love okay thank you okay uh, how much time do we have okay. yeah so last question Okay. So, yeah. So, if we are not the doers, does that mean that we should not do anything? And how do we see our mistakes if we are not the doers? See, this that that doership is a subtle concept because at one level the Bhagavad Gita says one who thinks that is the doer is an illusion. Prakrte kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvasha ankara vimud atma. कर्ताहम इति मन्यते दैट्स 3.27 पॉइंट ट्वेंटी सेवन इन द गीता बट देन एट द एंड ऑफ द गीता इन एटीन पॉइंट सिक्सटी थ्री कृष्ण सेज दैट विमृश्यत दशेषेन यथेच्छसि तथा कुरु डेलिब्रेट डीपली ऑन दिस मैसेज एंड देन डू एज यू डिजायर सो कुरु कर्ता इट्स अ वेरिएंट ऑफ द सेम वर्ड सो अर्जुना इज सेलिंग डू एज यू डिजायर सो इफ अर्जुना इज नॉट द डू वर्ड देन वाई इज कृष्ण सेलिंग अर्जुना डू एज यू डिजायर एंड देन टेन वर्स इज लेटर In 18.73, Arjuna tells Krishna that "Karishye vachanam tava," I will do your will. That means I will be the doer. So, if we are not the doers, then what? What does the conclusion of the Gita mean? Actually, this is explained in 18.16 that we are not the only doers. Tatraivam sati kartaram atma nam kevalam tu yah. पश्यत्य अकृत बुद्धित्वान न स पश्यति दुर्मति ही दैट वन हु थिंग्स आत्मा नाम केवलम तु यह वन हु थिंग्स आई एम दी ओनली डूअर दैट पर्सन इज नॉट सींग प्रॉपरली दैट पर्सन इज इन इल्यूजन सो राइट नाउ आई एम स्पीकिंग सो आई एम द डूअर बट आई एम नॉट दी ओनली डूअर आई वॉन्ट टू स्पीक राइट नाउ बट सपोज आई गेट कफ आई वॉन्ट टू स्पीक बट आई नॉट बी एबल टू स्पीक the cuff attack persists i'll not be able to speak at all i want to speak a part i want to remind, uh, speak a particular verse but if i don't get the recollection i won't be able to recite that verse so for we do we are we we are we are one of the doers in the action so to think ourselves as the doer is not the illusion to think ourselves to be the sole doers is the illusion so sometimes our mistakes are that we do our part wrong say if i am driving a car and somehow i am inattentive and the car veers off and goes and hits the curb so that's my inattention which caused a mistake over there but circumstantially if some passer by 
on the happens to be on the curb at that time and they get hit then this mistake will lead to much greater consequence there's nobody there it's just my car that gets damaged a little bit so basically our mistakes also we are responsible for the wrong that we do but beyond that sometimes circumstances may arrange in such a way may be in such a way that a small mistake may lead to a big consequence and sometimes a big mistake may also lead to only a small consequence so that's where past karma also comes into the picture so not acknowledging that there is much more than our action which determines the result that is the illusion but uh, our actions are important and our actions are something which we are meant to choose our actions are not krishna that our mistakes are not krishna's plan krishna has given us in scripture how we are to act and if we don't act according to the way krishna tells us then that is a mistake on our part so our mistakes are because we do have free will and we are meant to use the free will properly illusion is to think that we alone are the producers of the results of our actions does that answer your question Okay. I mean, does three point twenty seven mean that I'm not the doer? Do we need to add I'm not the only doer over there? Okay, let's look at what the verse exactly is saying. Prakriti kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvashaha ahankar vimudhatma karta amiti manyate. So prakriti refers to material nature, mm-hmm. and whatever we are doing right now in this world, we have to do it. through material nature only if i am acting at the material level and i am a spirit soul so i cannot do it without a material instrument and that material instrument may work according to my desire but i don't control its working so right now when i am speaking uh, some scientists try to simulate the process of human speech they try to study how our voice cords work it's a very complicated process as so sometimes if you have mechanized voices they just don't sound like a human voice the computer may have text to speech but it's just so flat but because our production of voice is such a complicated process so anything that is done when it is done at the material level the material body is involved and we could say the material body is the primary thing that is involved just like say if i use a computer and i say i'm chatting with someone on facebook or on skype or wherever now i cannot chat with that person without the computer so whatever i am do- i am doing is through the computer only so everything that i am doing in that chat is through the computer but it is not that the computer is doing it and i am not doing it so what the bhagavad gita is saying is in this verse that what material nature is doing if i take credit for that ahankar see the word is ahankar ahankar is arrogance you know we try to sometimes say the body is like a vehicle it's like a car so ahankar means aham car i am the car so <laughs> i am the body we think that that is ahankar so the illusion is to think that what is done by the body is done by me i am the initiator of the action So, but let's say i may write a particular type of a particular message on the phone or on the computer but the whole process by which that message goes to the other person is another part of the world that i am not doing that the technology which is doing that so just as when we get very habituated to using uh, some technology we don't even think there's anything special over there you know i just type and it goes to that person so we are so habituated to using this body that we don't think there's anything beyond us but we notice it when as we are not able to speak say so i am not the doer so the when krishna is saying material nature is doing everything uh, that is not wrong because whatever is done in this material world is done through material nature so the illusion is to when karta bhav the doership is the thing that what material nature is actually doing to think that i am doing it and to take credit for that that is the illusion okay so thank you very much श्री प्रभुपाद की गौर भक्त वृंद की हिताय गौर प्रेमानंद जी
Would you like to speak about the books? Yes. Can you just get some other books?